Pediatric Cardiology Today. My name is Dr. Robert Pass, and I'm the host of this podcast. I am professor of pediatrics at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, where I'm the chief of pediatric cardiology. Thank you for joining me for this 287th episode of the podcast. I hope everybody enjoyed last week's historic episode in which we spoke with Dr. Wayne Toretsky and Dr. Ryan Callahan about fetal interventions for aortic stenosis. For those of you with an interest in this fascinating topic, I'd certainly recommend that you listen to last week's episode with these two world authorities on this very interesting topic. As I say most weeks, if you'd like to get in touch with me, my email is easy to remember. It's pdheart at gmail.com. This week, we move on to the world of adult congenital heart disease and Fontan-associated liver disease. The title of the work we'll be reviewing is Intrahepatic Transcriptomics Differentiate Advanced Fibrosis and Clinical Outcomes in Adults with Fontan Circulation. The first author of this work is Katia Bravo-James, and the senior author is Fadi M. Kadis. And this work comes to us from multiple centers throughout the United States. Dr. Bravo-James comes to us from the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. When we're done reviewing this paper, Dr. Bravo-James has kindly agreed to speak with me about it. Therefore, let's get straight on to this article and then a conversation with its first author. This week's work reviews some facts about Fontan-associated liver disease, or FALT, which is a topic we've discussed many times on this podcast, including one of the very first episodes over 280 episodes ago. The authors explain how early fibrosis is seen in virtually all Fontan patients, and that the degree of this can be linked to how long a patient is a Fontan and what their hemodynamics look like. They review that FALD is largely associated or due to higher inferior vena cava pressures of Fontan patients and chronic passive liver congestion. At its worst end stage, the authors speak of decompensated cirrhosis and even some rare patients who can develop hepatic carcinoma. They explain how the physiology of the Fontan patient results in diminished oxygen delivery to the central lobular cells, zone 3 hepatocyte atrophy, sinusoidal fibrosis, and eventually, possibly, bridging fibrosis and even frank cirrhosis. This work set as a goal a better understanding of the molecular pathways that are occurring in these patients, and they state that the hypothesis of this work was actually threefold, and I'm going to quote the authors. We assessed intrahepatic gene expression profiles in adults with the Fontan circulation compared with donor control subjects to test the hypothesis that 1. Despite clinical heterogeneity, patients with the Fontan circulation and advanced fibrosis exhibit a distinctive gene transcriptome that contrasts with that of early fibrosis and controls. 2. These differences involve enriched pathways related to angiogenesis. And three, molecular phenotyping can identify Fontan subgroups that exhibit distinct clinical features and prognosis. The authors then reviewed the study population of Fontan patients who were all adults greater than or equal to 18 years of age from the UCLA ACHD Center from January of 2005 to December of 2021, who had tissue from at least one liver biopsy in that time period. And the authors first explained that they have extraordinary degrees of data on these Fontan patients, And for those interested, I would certainly suggest reading this paper. But suffice it to say that the team had virtually every piece of clinical data you would ever want to know about a Fontan patient, including things like what medications were they on, what was the anatomy of the Fontan, the BMI, the arrhythmia status and treatment status, MRI data, cath data, exercise stress data, liver and other blood tests, as well as hemodynamics from catheterization. The authors explain that the general policy at UCLA is that Fontan adults are cathed about every 10 years with a liver biopsy, and because of this, they have a reasonable bank of formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded tissue specimens, and they also have a small but not tiny group of liver biopsy specimens from otherwise healthy patients with which they can compare. They then review the RNA preparation and sequencing process in this work, and it's fascinating to hear how they were able to get these data, but also how they were able to analyze the gene expression from the RNA that was extracted, and then determine if there were differences in gene expression and how they differed in the different patients with fault, but also how these differentially expressed genes were different from control subjects. Once they had the actual differential gene expression data, Then they did gene ontological assessment, whereby the authors looked to determine what's known about these differentially expressed genes and their association with disease. Finally, the authors also describe a composite clinical outcome, which reflected end-organ dysfunction outside the heart since the time of Fontan, 
that included things like decompensated cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinoma, need for liver transplantation, protein-losing enteropathy, chronic kidney disease, stage 4 or higher, or even death. And so just for those of you who may not fully understand, the basic goal of this work is to figure out the degree of expression of genes, which is sometimes referred to as changes in the so-called transcriptome, which is the rate of mRNA molecules expressed in a cell. And it allows, I think, an understanding of what on a cellular level is going on regarding differential expression of genes, especially giving us an insight into the gene activity in a particular piece of tissue. And by understanding these gene on and off regulations, the hope would be that we would have more insight into the molecular pathways that are resulting in the clinical findings and maybe even possibly use these data to help identify patients with or before they have clinical findings associated with these genetic changes. Much of the detail of how the authors performed this complex gene RNA data, as well as the statistical techniques employed, again are in the paper. And so I would once more refer the listener to the manuscript, not only for this description, but for the massive number of tables and data that I'm only going to very briefly review. As they say, the devil's in the detail, and there are many details herein. And on to the results! In total, there were 106 patients who had liver specimens for analysis and 14 controls. The median age of the Fontan patients was 31 years, with an interquartile range of 11.3 years, and roughly half were male. 67% of the patients were white, 27% Hispanic. 15 patients, or 14%, had no fibrosis, 50 patients, or 47%, had mild or early fibrosis, and 41 patients, or 39%, had advanced fibrosis. The authors give to us many different associations between advanced fibrosis and clinical features, and again, please do read the paper, but they essentially show how, generally speaking, more advanced fibrosis on univariate analysis was associated with worse clinical findings and data both at cath, blood work, or even looking at who was on pulmonary hypertensive therapy. These are all perhaps not surprising, but still of value. Again, there were many, many data in this work, and I once more am going to suggest you read this paper, as this description will prove woefully lacking in comparison with the many, many findings of this work. But here are a few of the more important findings. First, there were 22 patients, or 22%, who reached the clinical composite outcome. However, on multivariable analysis, the clinical composite outcome, which you will recall was essentially those with very advanced non-cardiac disease like liver disease or even death, was not predicted by advanced liver fibrosis, RV morphology, the presence of aortopulmonary collaterals, or Fontan pressures. But what about the mRNA expression in comparison with the control specimens, and also according to the degree of fibrosis and composite clinical outcome, which really was the truly novel and important aspect of this work? Well, perhaps not surprisingly, but definitely novel. Samples with advanced fibrosis had 228 upregulated genes in comparison to those with early low levels of fibrosis. Importantly, samples of the 22 patients with the clinical composite bad outcome had 894 upregulated genes compared to those who didn't have the composite outcome, and there were 136 upregulated genes in both comparisons, and these genes were important to things like cellular response to cytokine stimulus or oxidative stress. VEGFA, VEGGF2 signaling pathways, which are associated with angiogenesis, and TGF beta signaling, which could be associated with tumor suppression as it has a role in antiproliferation in different cell types, as well as vascular development. In other words, the upregulated cell types observed were related to inflammation, congestion, and angiogenesis. In their discussion, the authors state, and I quote, In this first broad analysis of gene expression in liver tissue from a retrospectively identified cohort of patients with Fontan-associated liver disease, we reveal several important findings. First, patients with FALD and early fibrosis have a distinct transcriptome compared with control samples. Second, patients with FALD and advanced fibrosis have a distinct transcriptome versus those with early fibrosis. Third, Patients with FALD and advanced fibrosis are more likely to experience the composite clinical outcome, but this association did not reach significance in a multivariable model. Fourth, patients with FALD and the the composite clinical outcome have a distinct transcriptome compared with those without the composite clinical outcome. And fifth, we identified overlapping, differentially expressed genes between those with advanced fibrosis as well as the composite clinical outcome, 
and identified pathways related to pro-inflammatory responses and increased oxidative stress, impaired vascular endothelial function, enriched angiogenesis and vascular development, TGF beta signaling pathways, etc. These findings are important given that an inflammatory infiltrate on liver biopsies was not found, and we excluded samples with active hepatocellular carcinoma. These results expand our insights into fault pathophysiology and show potential candidate genes that could serve as biomarkers of adverse outcomes. The authors comment about how angiogenesis genes were important amongst the genes identified in this work and the novelty of this observation in fault. They speak about how elevations in angiopoietin 2 levels, which are expressed from the ANGPT2 gene, can be associated in other works with liver cirrhosis and liver cancers. This study did not identify that particular gene in the samples, but they mention how VEGFA, VEGFR2 signaling genes seen in this work were identified and also work in angiogenesis similar to the ANGPT2 gene. The authors point to limitations of the work, including its small sample size, the fact that nonparenchymal liver cells are known to play an important role in many liver diseases, and this work did not study this at all, and the absence of a comparison with other liver fibrosis diseases separate from FALD to see differences and confirm etiology-specific findings. And so they conclude, patients with FALD exhibit transcriptomic differences according to the degree of fibrosis and the presence of the composite clinical outcome. These genes are involved in pathways related to inflammation, congestion, and angiogenesis. This is certainly a novel way of looking at the problem of FALD. I clearly don't know a lot about this topic of transcriptomic differences, but my sense is that amongst a number of novel findings in this work, the finding of angiogenesis and inflammation playing an important role in the development of FALD may provide important new understanding for the development of FALD. I wonder if this form of testing might be useful in identifying patients earlier with advanced liver disease in this setting. We all know of the challenges of getting that timing for heart transplant right in the failing Fontan, as heart-liver transplantation represents an order of magnitude greater degree of risk versus heart alone, which is, of course, itself a major challenge in the Fontan patient for many different reasons. If this form of testing could provide insights into developing issues in the liver in this patient group, I think we would all view that as a very important advance. At this point, I think we'll move forward to speak with the work's first author, Dr. Bravo James. Joining us now to discuss this week's work is its first author, Dr. Katia Bravo-James. Dr. Bravo-James attended medical school at Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos in Lima, Peru. She completed her internal medicine residency at the University of Rochester, followed by cardiology fellowship at, at UT Houston, followed by ACHD training at UCLA. Dr. Bravo-James' interests include complex congenital heart disease, heart failure therapies in adults with congenital heart disease, cardio-obstetrics, global health, and strategies to mitigate racial disparities in cardiovascular medicine. It is a delight to welcome her to the podcast. Welcome, Dr. Bravo James, to the podcast. I'm here now with Dr. Katia bravo Jaimes. Dr. bravo Jaimes reminded me that I was not saying her name correctly, and I'm very appreciative of her correcting me, and I want to apologize to you because the entire first half of this podcast prior to this interview, I have mispronounced your name, so I'm very sorry, but I am thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Thank you, Dr. Paz. The pleasure is mine, and don't worry about mispronouncing my last name. It's a common thing that happens, but it's Bravo Jaimes, and I'm honored to be here and honored to be sharing with your audience the findings of this important study. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're all thrilled to have you, of course. You know, uh, Dr. Bravo Jaimes, I sometimes will ask an author to summarize for our listeners what they believe to be the most important three or four findings of their work. Um, I try to summarize it as you know I normally do on the podcast already, but I'm wondering if you could share with the audience what findings you felt were the most important and novel from your work. Yes, of course. I think that this is the first approach to omics in ACHD, as has been highlighted in the editorial. 
And one thing that I think it's very, very important to highlight is that collaboration is key to advance the field in ACHD in the 21st century. We need to include physician scientists from other disciplines, and we also need to expand our limited numbers that we usually have in congenital heart disease via multicenter studies, and that's going to be the second phase, the follow-up study from the current publication. The second highlight is to uh, recognize that liver biopsy repositories have tremendous potential for using research. We know that we have moved away from doing liver biopsies in several centers, but the centers who have this option um, have to recognize that this is gold um, mm. in reality, and we achieved more than 80% high quality samples when isolating RNA from biopsies that were stored for several years. But this also requires technical expertise that may not be available, you know, homogeneously. Um, and the third thing is that um, in our study, Fontana associated liver disease has an inflammatory pathogenesis, despite not having inflammatory cells on the liver biopsy. And this is something that constitutes a paradigm change from our current under understanding of FALD. Mm -hmm. Finally, we can highlight that angiogenesis is present in this condition, even in the absence of hepatocellular carcinoma. And this is important because it's part of the fibrotic process that we will discuss further in detail later on. I see. Well, that was really helpful. Uh, thank you so much. I, that really crystallized things very nicely for me. And I'll just mention that we do biopsy all of our ACHD patients. Uh, and so I'm sure that Dr. Zaidi, Dr. Uh, Love, and myself would be very happy to share with you specimens if in the future you do a multi-center study. So keep us in mind at Mount Sinai. Um, so, Dr. Bravo Jaimes, uh, can you give the audience a general sense of just how difficult this sort of testing that you report is? Uh, I, I'm not as familiar with this. I don't think many clinicians are. How, how long does it take to get an individual patient test done? At the present time, is there any clinical testing of this nature, or, or is this pretty much at this time an investigative tool? This is not a clinical test to monitor FALD. And at the moment, it's an exciting research tool. We are really many years away from the way that oncologists, for example, use some of these biomarkers in their biopsy. We are not really there. A bulk transcriptomics, we have to think about it as a blender where the liver tissue goes, and then we isolate the transcripts. It does not give us the specific transcripts available in each individual cell, nor the interaction between cells. Mm -hmm. The process, um, it's quite lengthy, you're right, and it starts identifying the stored liver biopsy, getting micrometric uh, shaving, isolating the RNA, and then processing the quality of these samples to later obtain the transcriptomic profiles at a core laboratory. Mm -hmm. When we process the samples, we do so in batches, and we adjust for this using bioinformatic tools. The cost per sample can vary from center to center, but in our case, it was approximately fixed 50,000 for the samples that we processed. Mm, mm, I see. So uh, not quite ready for prime time, although in research for sure. Um, I'm wondering if you could explain for the audience how the differential gene expression findings that you report are providing novel insights into the pathophysiology of FALD uh, that we didn't know prior to this work. You hinted at angiogenesis before. Maybe you could share with us your insights into this. Sure. Um, FALD has been classically described as a non-inflammatory condition. In our study, we noted for the first time that inflammatory pathways are involved in the pathogenesis of FALD. And we have to think even beyond what we reported. What is the reason why we're not seeing these findings? There are studies that examine the role of um, neutrophil extracellular traps or nets that are being involved in the pathogenesis of alcoholic as well as non-alcoholic liver disease and portal hypertension. We have to think about these nets as filamentous structures that uh, consist of extracellular DNA, granular proteins, histones, 
and these are exuded by a neutrophil in response to various stimuli. Um, this net, it's going to provide a scaffold that binds later to thrombi, um, red cells, fibrinogen, fibronectin, and can later deposit in the tissues and, you know, form uh, a fibrotic core and also uh, much more progression of, of these conditions um, in vivo. Yeah. The problem that happens when we process the samples is that these neutrophils, you know, are easily um, inactivated um, outside of the tissue itself. And since they're in the circulation and sometimes deposited, we're not really going to find them in the biopsies themselves. But the inflammatory cascade that took place after their deposition, it's probably what we're seeing in our study. In regards to the angiogenesis pathways, we have seen that um, we have a very high expression of VEGF alpha and its receptor, um, as well as other angiogenic pathways. In this case, we have to remember that this is one of the main pathways that promotes the growth of new vessels, but it's also accompanied by plasma leakage. And this is very important because it will set um, the stage for further um, inflammation while we're attempting to regenerate the liver. These are pathways that are normally expressed in the initiation of liver degeneration. There are studies that have looked at it when they do hepatectomies, for example, and they come um, really useful when it's for a good use. However, um, we know that in the process of uh, disorganized fibrosis, it can really bite our tails and become a very... um, tremendous process that can set the stage for complications in the future. And it may not only be um, found in the liver in isolation, we need to really look at other organs where this fibrotic process is also taking place. I see. And are any of these uh, enhanced signaling pathways, are they are there any oncologic uh, gene upregulation that you identified? For example, is uh, the VEGFA or the TGF beta pathways, are those also associated with cancers? Like, does that have any explanation, perhaps, for why hepatocellular carcinoma can be seen in these patients? Yeah, so the VEGF is um, it's also shared by some cancers. Um, it's shared by several conditions as well. Diabetic retinopathy, for example, is one of them. And the same hepatocellular carcinoma can have high levels of VEGF. Um, The problem in there is that we have to differentiate when it's only a precursor than when it's something well-established that will need the targeted therapies that we have for this condition. Um, We do not have the understanding yet of when is that turning point, but I think it's important to continue this line of research to identify when that gatekeeper comes in so we can adequately block it. I see, I see. Well, uh, for those in the audience, it's uh, late in the day on Monday evening, and uh, so I don't want to take up a tremendous amount of Dr. Bravo Jaimes's time, so I'm going to finish up here. You know, given that we generally can tell clinically and from a standard liver biopsy and imaging if a patient has fibrosis and even the degree of it, I'm wondering if you think that the quantitative findings of this form of intrahepatic transcriptome measurements can still improve clinical decision-making in, a pa- in this patient group. Uh, where do you think, for example, these sorts of data might be useful? For example, would it be helpful in predicting with a Fontan who's at risk of developing enough liver disease to warrant a liver heart transplant versus heart alone? Could it differentiate patients who have uh, the composite clinical outcome that you describe in your work before they clinically demonstrate the bad features that comprise your clinical composite outcome? I think that clinically, usually our best parameters to estimate what will happen with the liver include the VASC score, which was derived from 79 patients, and then the recently published FALD score, which was derived from 103 patients. Um, the current report, um, we have you know, mostly patients who have had very uh, good results in the extremes. 
if they are, you know, no fibrosis or very early fibrosis per sinusoidal, we feel that if they have low scores, we are okay only with a heart transplant. I think in the other extreme, if we have significant splenomegaly, thrombocytopenia, a significant number of paracentesis and cirrhosis, it's a slam dunk. We know that this patient will need dual organ. Right. But we have to understand that the patients don't always come in those two ways. There are also many patients who come in a third batch where they could have some bridging fibrosis, some clinical or laboratory characteristics that are um, coming with advanced uh, findings. And there could be a variety of opinions about the fate of the liver when approaching this question of heart-only versus heart-liver transplant. Mm -hmm. I think that in this third scenario, we're probably going to see much more um, help from the findings of this and future studies when we can identify those gatekeepers, those transcripts that are highly expressed in patients who do not come back, right? And if we can later see what are the specific cells, and if we can translate it to a biomarker, that will be the ideal sort of test for us to say that um, this patient will benefit more likely from a combined transplant uh, rather than just a single organ. In case of the clinical composite outcome, uh, it's still very early to say that this is going to be um, a very useful um, marker for our transcriptomes associated with this clinical composite outcome. It's important in general in science to always have an external validation cohort, patients who are of different characteristics than the ones that we found at UCLA, and see if our findings still hold true. Um, that will take, again, as I said, multi-center collaboration, and I'll be more than happy to continue talking to you about including Mount Sinai or <laughs> future studies. <laughs> but certainly, I think it is it opens the door for much more refinement, potential biomarkers, and potentially better decision-making when approaching this question of heart versus heart-liver transplant. Sounds to me like basically... Your work is perhaps, at least at this time, more useful in understanding the mechanism of FALD, not perhaps as a clinical tool just yet, uh, but really more understanding uh, on a molecular basis why these patients are are, are developing this problem. Um, you know, as, as I'm, I'm talking to you, I'm wondering, you know, you've hinted at a multi-center study. What is the next step you're taking in this uh, exciting new area within the study of fault. We're hoping to continue this line of research where we can identify the pathogenesis much more in detail. Like I said, we have just taken the blender approach. We need to now see what the specific cells are doing, how they're interacting. And this is, you know, um, this will require something called digital spatial transcriptomics and single cell analysis. So we're hoping to launch a study focused on that in FALD with the centers that have uh, liver tissue. So I will be following up with you for sure. <laughs> well, I'm already volunteering my buddy, Dr. Zaidi, but I'm pretty sure that uh, he and Dr. Hopkins and Dr. Uh, Love would probably be very excited to participate. Well, uh, Dr. Bravo Jaimes, a great pleasure to have you on the podcast. Congratulations to you and all of your many co-investigators. I know there were a lot of people involved in this project and I uh, want to thank you once more for coming on the podcast this week. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you to all your audience. Thank you very much. Well, I don't really have a lot more to say as Dr. Bravo Jaimes was again an uncommonly clear guest and provided for us a lot of context for many of us who may not be as familiar with the world of transcriptomics. I thought her comments about the novel way she has demonstrated inflammation to be an important component of this process of Fontan-associated liver disease to be a very important and interesting concept, particularly since the actual biopsies do not typically demonstrate such. Off-air, she emphasized for me the critical importance of collaboration and how despite not being a PhD scientist in microbiology, she was able to work with wonderful colleagues at UCLA to proceed with such a project and she emphasized how important it is to have friends in multiple disciplines to get something important done, like this work. I think there's a lesson in that for all of us.
I'd once again like to thank Dr. Bravo Jaimes for taking time from her busy schedule to speak with us about her work this week. To conclude this week's episode of PD Heart, in which we have a medical science guest who hails from Peru, I thought it would be nice to end the episode with another Peruvian, the great Peruvian tenor Juan Diego Flores, who was born in Lima, the same city as Dr. Bravo James Medical School. Mr. Flores indeed studied at the Conservatorio Nacional de Musica in Lima and ultimately received a scholarship to the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia. And his fame and greatness as a tenor became well known throughout the world, and he is today one of the single most sought after singers throughout the globe. He's also a wonderful guitarist, and today we hear him in a live performance of Velasquez's beautiful song, Besame Mucho, and the guitar you hear is in fact Mr. Flores himself. Thank you very much for joining us for this week for the podcast, and thanks once again to Dr. Bravo. I hope all have a wonderful week ahead. Besame, besame mucho. Como si fuera esta noche la última vez Bésame, bésame mucho Que tengo miedo a perderte, perderte después Bésame, bésame mucho Como si fuera esta noche la última vez Bésame, bésame mucho Que tengo miedo a perderte, perderte después Quiero tenerte muy cerca Mirarme en tus ojos, verte junto a mí Piensa que tal vez mañana Yo ya estaré lejos, muy lejos de aquí Bésame, bésame mucho Como si fuera esa noche la última vez Bésame mucho, que tengo miedo a perderte, perderte.